helps admin David from Trivial Solutions. I owe you. And today I'll talk about uh, load balancers. And uh, of course, most companies use them. If you had at least two nodes serving HTTP requests, then you're probably gonna need a load balancer. So here, I'll just uh, talk about all my experience over the years and I have this uh, hash map in my head. If if I want to avoid trouble, what do I use, right? And I can cover from this, like, you'll be able to cover any load balancing need, like any sort of pattern you want from these that I will show here today. So, of course, first, I like to talk, not in technical terms, but high level, what do I want? When I'm deploying a load balancer, what do I want its characteristics to be? What do I want it to uh, achieve so that it would be cheap and efficient to run it? So what do we want? I want to avoid debugging it. So as a rule of thumb, right, if you take something off the shelf that's to the test of time, then you'll have a lot less issues than if you roll a new load balancer by yourself. And in these days, I'll just throw these guys in there. <laughs> just because you can write a load balancer quickly in Golang today, doesn't mean you should. In fact, you almost never should. <laughs> don't do that, avoid it. Like, I don't like to debug a load balancer, right? Ideally, load balancer is like, I want to deploy it and it just keeps on running its server request and that's it, you're done with the day. I don't want to spend extra time debugging it. And we, of course, want to avoid maintaining it. So, of course, if we don't roll load balancer by hand, then we don't have a lot of code to config, uh, to debug, right? And to update with new features. We might need to update like a config and that's a lot less issue than uh, writing code. So yeah, so we also want to avoid maintaining maintenance of code. And also we want low overhead from a load balancer. Ideally, it shouldn't take a lot of resources from machine because when you think about it, a load balancer, so load balancer is basically you get packets on a machine and you forward packets somewhere else. Ideally, that shouldn't be a lot of CPU work. And when you, you know, like you have a 10 gigabit uh, ethernet adapters, ethernet cards, you should get 1.2 gigabytes of traffic out of that. So if your load balancer is only serving like, a, I don't know, 10 megabytes of traffic and it's already 99% CPU gazillion of memory, that's not the best load balancer, right? You know, <laughs> you should probably get something that your load balancer should be that it uses a lot less resources than the end services that receive traffic from it, right? So that would be ideally the case, right? And of course, low overhead, low resources, and of course, we want to cover lots of uses because load balancer, you know, if you can use it only once or twice per year on the very rare projects, it's not a good load balancer. A good load balancer, you should be able to deploy it a lot, right? Use it a lot, then you can master that component all of that is in your head, all your intricacies. And once you know one load balancer really well, you can satisfy a lot of need for your clients. Knowing one load balancer and you don't have any surprises, if it's good, then you know, just you deploy it and it works. You're done with your day, right? So, so yeah, so what do I want in a high level? We talked about it. Now let's talk about three candidates that I believe fill all of these characteristics. Right. So first is, and uh, the order is, you know, what I would prefer. And if I can't use this, then I use something else. And if I can't do this, then I use something else. Priority, the order of these components, what I use if I can. So the first component is Nginx slash OpenResty. Nginx, probably pretty much everyone will know who watches this video. OpenResty is a uh, not everyone might not know this. So what is OpenResty? OpenResty is Nginx fork that allows you Lua scripting. So you can script any logic in various places like, you know, heaters filtering, bodies filtering, picking uh, upstream 
and all various timeouts, like you can uh, background send logging data with uh, OpenResty. So basically, it allows you to script Nginx to do pretty much everything that you want, right? There are some limits, for instance, I don't use for TCP, but it, you know, usually if you're just serving HTTP request, and let's be honest, most people that uh, deploy microservices are serving HTTP requests, then you can, uh, ideally, you can just use Nginx, like vanilla, if that's enough for your use case. If you don't need, like you have a couple of streams and random load balancing amongst these services, then yeah, fine, you just need config. But sometimes there are cases where you want to have Nginx solidity, but you need little bit of code to configure like a specific like load balancing strategy. So for instance, I had uh, this case once that, you know, OpenResty is running and uh, I'll call this Nginx, right? And uh, then it receives from NatsQ real-time upgrades. So this is NatsQ. And uh, then I cannot like uh, say to Nginx, you know, just subscribe to that queue. I needed to write a little software that listens to the NATS queue for upgrades and then it performs HTTP posts. And uh, basically this microservice updates uh, the mirrors in memory in OpenResty. It's like a shared uh, cache or something, I think. And it basically updates all these mirrors real time and Nginx can then just with OpenRest, you can receive requests. It has in-memory map of up-to-date data, like it's real time, sub-millisecond before data gets in the queue and before it ends up in the Nginx upstreams. Then you have this updated map and in real time, you can serve requests to up-to-date mirrors. For instance, if certain node is trailing on something, you cannot serve from that, right? So. You know, that was one really interesting use case. And you can roll balancer by yourself that would do that for you. But what I, why I like OpenResty, right? So this is basically like say this is all the code that has this. Uh, this is all the code of this load balancer, like with Nginx, uh, the original sources. And then I have this tiny Lua script then I have this tiny Lua script, like it's sub 1% or even much less than 1%. And I just control high level actions. I can pick a load balancer like this, right? I can uh, like perform query to some web server, like to check access for this, right? I just write very little high level code and I have the rest of 99% plus Nginx original rock solidity here. Right, so that's why I like the setup as opposed if I write, need to write entire my own loan balancer from scratch, then you know, that's just 100% of my code and who knows how solid this part is. <laughs> of course, I didn't spend years on developing such load balancer, so I'll make probably lots of mistakes, right? It will probably involve a lot of subtle bugs <laughs> that you need to work out. Ain't nobody got time for that. So I just, if I need something super specific and I can make Open Resty with Nginx do that, I just write very Lua code and I'm done, right? So that's the logic behind it. So yeah, so this is extensible. I mentioned that this is rock solid. Nginx is very popular. I never had a case where Nginx would be the first one to break down before services that it forwards traffic to breaks down. It's just super low latency. It doesn't have a garbage collection pauses. It's very fast uses very little resources. You can run it under like a uh, hundred bags of RAM if you want. And another thing why I like Nginx so much and when I prefer to use it whenever I can, I noticed from practice that I usually don't need to tune any knobs and dials. Usually if you pick a, like the default config and you don't do anything else, you test your request that you want to work and they work, you usually don't need to do anything else then. Right, and you just put it in and you forget about Nginx and it's just working <laughs> and, and you're done with your day. Like, so that's like, I think it's very, you know, subtle because you don't need to tune Nginx usually what, once it's working. It's just, you just enjoy it working and that's it, right? So 
That's why I love en using Nginx so much. Okay, so that's about Nginx and OpenRSC. I think very powerful combination. If I can achieve what I want, my load balancing needs with this, this is the first choice that I go to. And second thing, okay, so Nginx, it's not the TCP load balancer, it's HTTP mainly load balancer. Well, it has WebSocket support, but you know, it's still technically HTTP requests, right? So if you want to load balance like lower level traffic, like for instance, Postgres instance, right? And uh, then you need to load balance on a TCP socket. So what I do in such cases, I do deploy HA proxy. And it has a lot of characteristics of Nginx, right? But it's uh, more TCP level. Of course, it has also HTTP support, but uh, you know, when I can, when I need HTTP, I usually go for Nginx, right? So, but this allows you, there are a lot of protocols like, you know, Kafka or Nets, uh, binary streams or Postgres or MySQL wire protocol. And if you want high availability, what I do then, and I need load balancing for that, I deploy HA proxy. And since I use console for the custom DNS services, HA proxy uh, constantly refreshes the mirrors. And if you know some services down connection is cut, then client transparently gets another TCP session, uh, completely another node. So you can separate like master and follower servers like that also, you know. So that's the another choice that I have for lower level connections, right? If I can't use Nginx, I use an HA proxy and I also have this uh, pattern quite often. So you say like you have uh, some service and it needs to, to have access to say like a cluster of, uh, you know, possibly Redis cluster or something. So you wouldn't need a lot of retrial logics. You can put locally HA proxy and it goes to the local, or this could be like HTTP requests. You can configure retries and this is the local instance. And then it would go to a lot of other instances, you know, say this is a cluster and you can have connections to that, right? Then you don't need to worry about does this service retry? Does this regain the latest connection? Does this do this, that? You can put HA proxy in front and you know, you can achieve that automatically when needed, right? So yeah, so that's another load balancer that again, stood a test of time. I. I avoid new stuff that's like very exotic. The logos look nice. There are many GitHub stars. <laughs> Who knows if they purchase those GitHub stars, right? Who knows, right? And, you know, I just like to know if I need something boring to accomplish what I need, I have OpenResty. And if I, need, if I have TCP needs, then I have HA proxy and, and that's how I live, right? So it's very, I do very boring stuff. I just like to deploy things and know they work. I know that I'm using solid technology that's to the test of time, right? And that's how I go on with my day personally, right? I, I avoid new stuff, basically. So, okay, so that's another, wait, what is this? My, oh, and another thing I did not mention, one last thing. Uh, HA proxy, I noticed that you might need to dial some knobs, right? You might need to, uh, like uh, configure timeouts, what they need, uh, like how many connections and stuff. Uh, I, I found that, you know, you need to do a little bit of that, right? It's not much, you know, usually once you get it working, it's working like Nginx, but you know, it's, I say it's a little more configuration of dialing, uh, dials and knobs, tuning than Nginx, right? So this is, this is just one, you know, subtle difference. And okay, so, and the Armageddon scenario, you know, which I, which happened for me, like I cannot do anything with Nginx and I cannot use HA proxy, right? So for instance, this was uh, one case where, you know, I needed to, I have a few mirrors to forward to and I need to do something like really, really specific. I issue requests to one mirror. So this is say, uh, the load balancer and you have a few mirrors of software and then you issue request here 
while you're waiting, five milliseconds passes, right? And after five milliseconds, you need to issue to another, right? And the logic here is that, you know, if while this request is in flight, the server goes busted, you don't suffer a big round trip time because uh, the request might take like 100 milliseconds or so. So you don't want to, you know, okay, I didn't receive request, then 100 milliseconds pass. But if you wait five milliseconds and issue another request, as this request is in flight, then, you know, if this fails, okay, I have another backup that will return approximately five milliseconds later. And then you still have requests and then you can serve it to the client. So I found that I couldn't, or at least I didn't find a way how to do this. You know, if you know how to do that in uh, Open Resty, let me know in the comment. I'd really appreciate it. But I found that I can't do that. So what I did in that case, the Armageddon scenario, I write my own Rust custom load balancer. And why in Rust? So this is, of course, this is last resort. If both these fail, then I do this. It uses slow resource footprint, right? So it doesn't use a lot of memory. It's very, you know, stable usage. And it uses very little CPU. And I use Tokyo, you know, an Actix web now uh, to serve web requests blazing fast. It's very fast. It's, it's almost like a, an Nginx, I'd say, but you know, so this point still applies that with Nginx, I need to write very little Lua and this thing is already there working and here I need to write like 100%. Well, not 100% as you use library, but you know, it's uh, not as nice if, if you can accomplish it, this, right? So this is, this is the last resort. I write a custom load balancer to achieve such use case, right? And it has no garbage collection pauses, like, you know, it's popular to write. Uh, load balancers with Golang, they usually use more resources than they have garbage collection pause and that. So yeah, so that's why I avoid it. And of course it has very, Rust has very strong type system. It has C++ performance, but it's high level language, I'd say. And a lot of errors are caught before production. So obviously if I wrote this like in uh, Python, say load balancer, it might not perform ideally, but imagine then I might need uh, to have a lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of tests to cover that everything is working. And here, usually you have types ID helps you. And if uh, your project compiles, then it, it usually just works. For these things, I found that I don't have to write that many tests for Rust as in some dynamically typed language, because usually, you know, it compiles and it just works and you're done with your day, right? So from these uh, three, I think we covered uh, every use case under the sun of how to get a load balancer. So again, I prefer OpenRSD if I can, and if it's CCP and simple HA proxy. In an absolute worst scenario, then I can roll, if these don't work, then I only resort to writing my own load balancer in Rust. Do not do that if you don't have to. <laughs> do, do not, waste your time like that if there's already these things that work you know just deploy them enjoy your day right so that's our role with load balancers of course if you have uh, any tips or suggestions feel free to leave them a comment below so yeah so this, this has been david from trivialsolutions.io i'm signing out peace